السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ربی شرحلی صدری و یسلی عمری وحل العقدت من لسانی یفقہ قولی ربنا زدنا علما اللہم فقہنا فی الدین آمین یا رب العالمین سو ہیر وی آر ود آر سیشن نمبر فور آف کلاس پاور آف دعا سو لیٹس میک آر دعا پاور فل اینڈ لیٹس اسٹارٹ ود آر ریویو ان شاء اللہ اوکے سو بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم You have a dua. Rabbana zalamna anfusana wa illam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lana kunanna min al-khasirin. You have learned two types of dua so far. Um, which type of dua it is? Is it um, dua al-mas'ala or dua al-ibadah? Yes, mas'ala. There is a sual in this dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our mistakes this is the dua of our parents adam alayhi salam in hawa and they are asking allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to forgive them right they are asking for forgiveness therefore you know that they are asking for something particular so this is dua ul masala everyone else um is also having a problem with uh, hearing me or it's just uh, sister iphone You're good, Azra? Okay. Uh, sister, can you, uh, can you join, uh, rejoin? Uh, disconnect and rejoin, and I think that might work, okay? Inshallah. So, okay. So, Rabbana zalamna anfusana. That means, oh my Rabb, we have wronged ourselves. So, when we are accepting and acknowledging our mistakes, and we are trying to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there was a term. There was a term that I spoke in our, in our last session. Who remembers that, you know, this is um, the way of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who has gone through the slides and remember the term? Um, it starts with T. So, and it includes um, Tawassul, Tawassul, Sister Aisha, Tawassul. I think Sister Azra, it could be a typo. Uh, so it is tawassul. Barakallahu feek, my dear sister. So you can get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by mentioning his great names and attributes. You can get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by acknowledging your sins and by mentioning your good deeds. And you can uh, ask um, for tawassul by asking someone who is living and is very pious to make dua for you, right? The, those were few of the um ways that we can perform a tawassul and those are um the ways that are according to quran and sunnah okay so because we need to do actions according to quran and sunnah right we have to follow quran and sunnah with each and every action of ours it should be in the light of quran and sunnah so make sure that that happens okay so here Um, our father has taught us and our mother has taught us the way uh, of tawassul that you know you acknowledge your sins and then ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness and to have mercy on ourselves right and then when we say rabbana so it's also another way of performing tawassul because rabb we are acknowledging that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is khaliq our creator Malik, our owner, Mudabir, our planner. He plans and arranges everything for us, right? Everyone with me so far? Type on if you are, and if you are awake as well. That will tell me how many of you are really listening and some people, you know, um, are, you know, not uh, there, but, you know, there, but not there, right? So to the help, it helps me differentiate. So I keep on telling people, okay, type one, type two, and this gives me an idea if people are really engaged versus they are not, they don't care what, what is being taught. So, okay. Another dua. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna kanta samiyululin. Dua al-ibada or dua al-mas'ala? Which type? Iba. Okay, ibada. Okay, that is also correct. What else? Would, let me translate it for you. Our Rabb, accept our deeds. Whatever I'm performing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, accept it from me. 
And this was the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail alayhi salam when they were building Kaaba. Because you may be performing an action and you don't know if it is going to be accepted. There may be Riya, there may be Suma, there may be, you know, the, your, your heart may not be at the right place when you are performing that action, right? So this is both of them. And the first one is also both of them, right? If you look at Dua, these two types, they are hand in hand with each other, right? When you go on to say, Inna ka anta So what is this? When you praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is, you know, Dua al-Masala and Ibadah both, right? Now, are we performing tawassul here in this dua? Is Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail alayhi salam performing tawassul here as well? Do you see any way of, you know, tawassul here? Because there were four or five that I taught you and I left the rest for the for later if we get a chance because I was to go over these things very briefly, but we sometimes spend all of our time in going over the main um etiquettes and you know the preconditions and then there's very little time left for dua itself so so inna ka anta samiul alim asami means the ever hearing al alim means the ever knowing so mentioning great names of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning attributes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the way of performing tabassul right my dear sisters yeah right so it is again we are performing tabassul that we are trying to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we also make this dua. This dua is not there for us to just read, okay, yeah, this is a dua. This is for us to apply in our life whenever you perform any deed, make dua, oh Allah, accept from us because there may be that, you know, I may have not done with full heart. My intention might have been not perfectly right. There may be an element where I am wanting to hear praise from people. I want people to acknowledge my contribution towards something right we we are human beings in the end right so then when we make this dua that helps us you know that helps uh, you know uh, us uh, keep our you know amal and intentions in in the right order okay so duas like this are very important whenever you do any good deed right away make these dua and teach your children to make them as well and tell them why this it needs to be made okay because that is very important as well because indeed Allah is the only one who is always hearing and is always knowing because he knows what you are going through when you do not get something he knows your pain he knows your suffering he knows what your heart is going through so always remember that so now Qalu, this is uh, the dua that was made by an army Rabbana afrig alayna sabran wa sabbit aqdamana what kind of dua this is? This is dua al-mas'ala. Yes, very well done. And, and always remember, this will be ibadah as well because you, you will going to tell me when you are going to teach your children, inshallah, my dear sisters, you are going to tell them that when you ask Allah, it is an ibadah, right? It is an ibadah when you ask Allah because dua is worship and we know it from hadith of our beloved prophet. We are not knowing it from, you know, also such and such said that. No, our beloved prophet said that and he never spoke out of his whims. Remember that. Everything was inspired to him, revealed to him, some in words and meanings, some, in, some text was revealed to him in terms of meaning, but not in terms of wording. So remember that. He never spoke used to speak out of whatever his heart desired it was all from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so it is all very sacred and very noble and we have to give it due respect right so in this dua you have learned seven meanings of word dua what are those seven meanings real quick because already 10 minutes gone I know it's worship, ibadah, very well done. So, al ibada or worship, speech, qawl, a call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Hukar, right? Seeking of an aid, asking a question, right? So, here you can see 
seeking of an aid one sunna and help us alal qaumil kafirin against these disbelievers right and we also praise allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we call rabbana we acknowledge that he is our creator he is our owner he is the one who provides for us right and we are calling him as well right afrig alaina when we when we make this dua we are calling him as well barakallahu feek my dear sisters so i think that is enough for review and we'll go over the rest of them in our next session inshallah let's start with the etiquette of dua what are the proper etiquettes of making dua inshallah bismillah rahman rahim so here so the first etiquette that you we have to follow is praising allah subhanahu wa taala why so when you make you know when you are in ruku and you are going to the position of qauma which is when you stand after ruku what do you say sami allahu liman hamida and this is from the hadith of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that allah listens to the one who praises him so when we are going to make dua it is incumbent on us that we praise allah subhanahu wa taala allah subhanahu wa taala loves to be praised he is allah our rabb and we are asking him at every moment of our life we are always poor we are in poverty and in needy and we are always needy so we always when we are asking for so much it is incumbent upon us that we praise allah subhanahu wa taala before we make any dua to him and then part b of uh, is that you pray upon praying upon prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so it was from hadith of um, prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam fadala ibn ubaid said in abu daud it has been documented the messenger of allah subhanahu wa taala sallallahu alaihi wasallam heard a man making supplication in his prayer without glorifying allah subhanahu wa taala or praying for blessing on the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said this one was in hurry then he called him and said to him or to someone else so there is a um it could be that you know he prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam called somebody else and he said when one of you prays he should begin by glorifying his lord glory be to him and praising him and then pray for blessing on the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam which means durood in indo pak or salawat in all other parts of the world uh, then he should ask for anything else he wants afterwards so praising allah subhanahu wa taala and then making a salawat upon sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a etiquette of a dua then the second etiquette is raising one's hands it is very important that we raise our hands the the reason being the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was shown to you know was narrated to raise his hands on de- several different occasions anas radhiyallahu ta'ala an has said god's mes- messenger used to raise his hands in supplication so that the whiteness under his armpits was visible so he would raise his hands so high when he was making dua to allah subhanahu wa taala and your palms should be facing towards sky so make sure of that okay you cannot just put your hands either way or you know it, your palms should be towards the sky so it should be you know palms should be facing upwards then facing the qibla abdullah bin zaid said god's messenger to the people out to the place of prayer and prayed for the rain he led them in two rakats in the course of which he recited from the quran in a loud voice he faced the qibla making supplication raised his hands and turned around his cloak when he faced qibla so it is again proven from hadith that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he did all that when he prayed for the rain he raised his not only his hands but he also faced the qibla as well so try to make sure that when you are making any dua you face the qibla performing wudu and this is also again from the sunna of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was lying in his tent at this time and when he heard abu musa's 
Abu Musa, the uncle, asked for dua. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked for water, did wudu, and then he stood up, raised his hands as high as he could to the point that his armpits could be seen, and then he made dua. Oh Allah, forgive the sins of Abu Amir and raise his ranks among the Illiyin. It is a beautiful dua. So when Abu Musa heard all of this, he said, Ya Rasulullah, for me as well. And so Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made dua for Abu Musa as well. Oh Allah, forgive him his sins and cause him to enter a good abode on the day of judgment. Another etiquette of dua is to cry. One of the ways in which the sincerity is shown in dua is through crying. This brings about a feeling of humility and helplessness in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and shows the importance and the seriousness of your request. And this has been proven again through sunnah that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once said, Oh Allah, my ummah, my ummah, and he started crying. Allah said to the angel Jibreel, O oh Jibreel, go to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and your Lord knows and ask him what makes him cry. So Jibreel went to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and asked him, the Prophet responded that he was crying out of concern for his followers. Just like Ibrahim and Isa were concerned for their followers and Allah knew why he was crying without having to ask Jibreel. So Allah said, O oh Jibreel, Go to Muhammad and say, we will please you regarding your followers and will not cause you grief. And this is from Sahih Muslim. To expect the best from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As, as we have learned before, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I am to my slave as he thinks of me which means I, I am able to do for him what he thinks I can do for him. So have full conviction of acceptance of your dua. You have limitations, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wasi al alim He has the perfect knowledge, perfect wisdom, and perfection in all in his attributes. He can do anything for you. He is al-aziz. Remember that. To pray with humility and fear is another etiquette of dua. So it has been said in Quran, in Surah Al-Araf, verse number 55, Call upon your Lord in humility and privately. Indeed, he does not like transgressors. Again, in another, uh, another verse from Surah Al-Araf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and invoke him in fear and aspiration, with full hope. Aspiration means hoping completely that this is going this prayer of mine is going to be granted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indeed the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is near to the doers of good then we learn another etiquette is to complain only to Allah and Quran teaches us that how Yaqub alayhi salam made this dua in Surah Yusuf verse number 86 he said innama ashku basi wa huzni ila Allah I only complain of my suffering and my sadness to Allah. Do we do that? Or do we make a phone call right away when we are in um, any uh, suffering or any, any difficulty? Try to do that. Go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost. He is the listener of dua, right? He listens and he hears you all the time. He's ever knowing and ever hearing as well. And again, we learn from Ayyub alayhi salam, inni masani ad-dur wa anta arhamu rahimin. Indeed, adversity has touched me and you are the most merciful of the merciful. To pray quietly, and this we have just seen in, uh, in Surah Al-Era, that call upon your Lord in humility and privately. Indeed, he does not like transgressors. So in privacy, try to make dua. Acknowledging one sin. And we started our day today, our session today, with this dua of Adam alayhi salam. Rabbana zalamna anfusana. Indeed, we have wronged ourselves, ma'arab. And we also learn from Prophet Yunus. La ilaha inta 
la ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu minaz zalimin right so acknowledge your sins when you are talking to allah subhanahu wa taala and asking allah subhanahu wa taala for anything to implore allah honestly beseech allah make a plea to allah keep on making plea to allah subhanahu wa taala to remain determined in your request to repeat the dua three times there are many duas that you will um be reciting in the morning in the evening and there is an you know there is a number of times that you have to make those duas right so to pray with the concise dua when we say rabbana atina fid dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa qina adhab annar very small dua and we have asked for goodness of this world and goodness in the hereafter and very in very few words we have asked for every good out there in the world in the hereafter to use duas of quran and sunna very very highly you know recommended okay to start with dua for your own with your own self rabbana ربنا اغفر لنا ولاخواننا الذين سبقونا بالايمان so here we see our rab forgive us and our brothers those who they have preceded us in the iman in the faith so here we see lana is referring to us so make your dua when you make making dua make dua for yourself first and then for your brothers okay to pray for all muslims especially your parents either they can be alive they can be dead they can be deceased please my dear sisters i request you all to make lots of dua for your parents they have done everything for you they are the only ones after allah who love you unconditionally so make lots of dua and this dua allah just did not say rabbir hamhuma kama rabbayani saghira allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said or rabbi 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 rahmhuma kama rabbayani saghira you say you tell people as well and it is not only applicable to prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but also to all of us from surah al isra this is surah number 17 in quran so to say amin after dua it was narrated from aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha that prophet said the jews don't envy you for anything more than they envy you for the salam assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh that means and saying amen so they are very very jealous of this word amen and amen do you know what it means it means allah respond allah please respond to my dua and you can say amen to you do to the dua that you are making and you can say amen to the dua that anyone else is making okay so another etiquette is make dua all at all times to make dua for all matters it can be the smallest of thing it can be the the most serious of the matter you have to make dua at all times and for all the matters and to make dua plentifully okay there is all you know it cannot be enough it has to it has to be a lot and a lot and a lot of dua to make dua when it uh, one is in the condition of response or in the at the time of response and we will inshallah um go over these last two um points in detail in our next sessions so today's dua is a very beautiful dua again allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafia wa rizqan tayyiba wa amalan mutaqabbala Allahumma o oh Allah e eh Allah inni indeed i beshak main as'aluka i ask you main tujhse sawal karti hu ilman nafia knowledge that is beneficial il nafa bakhshne wala wa rizqan tayyiba and provision slash sustenance or risk tayyiba pakiza pure wa amalan and deeds or amal mutaqabbala acceptable qabuliyat wala the running translation for this is oh allah i asked you for beneficial knowledge pure sustenance and acceptable deed eh allah beshak main sawal karti hu tujhse nafa baksh ilm ka pakiza risk ka aur amal jo qabuliyat paaye <coughs> so we already know 
there are three forms of knowledge and we have gone over them in our last session. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. So we know that the three types of knowledge that we have out there is one out of those three, one is the beneficial knowledge, ilm and nafia. One is harmful knowledge, ilm dar, that causes darar. And then there's a type of knowledge that is neither beneficial or harmful. So give me an example of beneficial knowledge real quick. What kind of knowledge is beneficial knowledge? What have we learned so far? Deen, knowledge of deen. And this is fard ayn or fard kifaya. Does everyone need to learn it? Or only few sisters are, I should be um, uh, uh, well versed with it? Everyone, everybody, your daughter, your son is not exempt. So please remember. And you can only give them that knowledge. You can only pass them that knowledge when you yourself have it, right? When your son comes to you and he tells you something that happened in school or he, he looked at something that he should have not looked at, you can only guide him when you have ilm and nafia. When your daughter comes to you, when your daughter comes to you with her problems, with it could be the problem of tahara or it can be you know, something that happened in school again. You can only rightly guide them when you are yourself equipped with ilman nafia. And that ilman nafia, which I'm talking about right now, is for the ayn. Everyone needs to learn it, spread it, teach it. If you cannot take a mic and start spreading to sisters around you, you can at least start with your home, right? And your own families. Then there is ilm dar. What is harmful knowledge? Give me one example. Magic. Very well done. Magic. So a person with, who knows, you know, magic is very, you know, knowledgeable as well. But this is not going to benefit them. It's going to be harmful for them in this dunya and hereafter. Right? And yes, wrong information. Whatever is on the social media, whatever is on television, if you are in habit of following all that and spreading that information just please this is a time this is a time this is a time to learn that we are not going to be part of anything my dear sisters we are now you know at this stage of our lives we need, we need to know that we need to know know that you know we read surat kahaf every friday and these there's a story of 10 you know a few boys there and these young men they only they only concerned for you know fleeing wars or taking refuge in cave wars that they wanted to protect their imam, and that is the most precious treasure that we have now if we have it. Okay, so we need to protect it. And how can we protect it if we don't know anything about it, right? If we don't first of all for to have iman, we have to have knowledge. And once you gain, gain knowledge and you have you are trying to build your iman, then you have to protect it as well. And you will be able to do so if you know and indulge yourself in the right things, right? So, and then uh, there is a kind of knowledge that is neither beneficial nor harmful, which is, you know, you, we all know about it, right? And following uh, celebrities and what they do and all that. So now coming back to our dua. So first was, Allahumma inni asaluka ilman nafia wa rizqan tayyiba. So ilman nafia, we have gotten quite a you know understanding of that. We have gone over it in our first three sessions, and now comes risk on tojiba. Remember when we were doing the precondition of dua? One of the precondition of dua is that your sustenance should be what? For your dua to be accepted, your sustenance should be pure. It should be halal, right? It should be halal. Everyone, please make sure. There are things that are not halal out there. I may be doing certain things in my job and I have to look for the halal sustenance. I have to make sure whatever I'm bringing my, my home, is it halal? It is tayyib? Because it has effect on, you know, on my, not only my, um, on myself, but it affects my family as well. Because if you, it, it, this is a, not uh, the exact wording, but uh, the connotation from the hadith is that, you know, if someone has been uh, raised on a, a, a earning that was not halal, 
that is going to be in the hellfire that is going to you know be um, the you know they have to you know be suffering in the, uh, and facing the fire of hell so we don't want that for our families and for ourselves right so halal and tayyib sustenance is very important so this word tayyib is it one in the same a halal and tayyib one are the same no it is not so let's just see what word tayyib means so tayyib is a word that it appears many times in quran and sunnah it can be used to describe people good deeds actions things or speech among others its literal meaning is something that is pure or good okay so it is something um that is pure or good that is um uh, wholesome and um for example something can be halal but it does not mean it is tayyib as well okay for example if i tell ask you is chocolate halal type yes or no what do you think can we eat chocolate is it halal yes it is halal but it is tayyib it is it good for your health if you eat it all the time if you are constantly uh, munching on it is it good for your teeth for your dental health hmm? you know for 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 those who indulge in it then they indulge in it <laughs> too much indulgence yes yes we can say that you know yeah if we eat in moderation I'm, i i got i get it yeah absolutely so for example if you eat an apple compare apple with the chocolate think of the uh, you know com uh, make a comparison of that and then that will you know be helpful right so when you e eat an apple it is halal and it is tayyib as well because it's good for you it has iron it has you know it's it has good vitamins right but compared to you know compare compare it with you know chocolate it's not you know it is not tayyib right so think of the uh, things like that you know when something is tayyib it is really really good for you it is you know it has all the good benefits in it okay so keep that in mind so and also remember allah only accepts that which is pure why do we want this halal tayyib but why is it important because remember allah does not accept but what is tayyib what is pure okay so we have to keep that in mind when we are you know um uh, giving anything to allah subhanahu wa taala or we, we, when we are you know um spending in the way of allah subhanahu wa taala so allah subhanahu wa taala is going to accept that which is halal and tayyib both okay so keep, keep that in mind so uh, um i have to go over this um hadith of uh, prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that um um prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned the case of a man who have journeyed far okay he is uh, disheveled and dusty and now what he is doing see look look at the hadith very um, very carefully he stretches out his hands to the sky saying o oh lord o oh lord his food was unlawful his drink was unlawful his clothing was unlawful and he is nourished with unlawful things so how can he be answered now he is making oh rabbana rabbana he is saying rabbana rabbana and we learned that from you know from our etiquettes of dua that we have to call allah subhanahu wa taala this way he is stretching his hands out he is following the second etiquette of dua as well but why he is not going to be answered because because his food was unlawful his drink was unlawful his clothing was unlawful and he is nourished with unlawful things so the dua is not going to be accepted so risk on tayyiban is very important not only risk no we are not going to just ask for risk but we are going to ask risk that is tayyib and that is halal as well okay i hope this is clear to everyone so when it comes to this um you know it, it, it tayyib is often um, considered in the context of food to indicate pure wholesome consumption of healthy organic and uh, food and drink um rather than a processed uh, junk food um the and it, it is very applicable as well so because you know you are what you eat right so keep that in mind that you when you are eating something it is tayyib as well not only halal so from this you should also get this that you know not only halal but tayyib as well it should be good for my health as well so the tayyib in hadith extends much further than just you know from food and drink and all that okay so and you know th this is going to be um um uh, you know uh, explained through this hadith that i just shared with you of sahih muslim so um i want to share one thing with you 
um, that is very, very important um, and uh, very interesting, actually, not important, more than important. It, I found it many, uh, very interesting. So one of our pious predecessors, uh, uh, predecessors uh, Thabit bin Numan, he was hungry and tired as he was passing through a garden that, uh, that bordered a river. He was so hungry that he could hear his stomach growling. And so his eyes became fixed on the fruits he saw on the various trees of the garden. In a fit of depression, um, he forgot himself and extended his hand. So he was so desperate that, you know, he just forgot everything. And he extended his hand to an apple that was within his reach. He ate half of it and then drank water from the river. But then he became overcome with the guilt, despite the fact that he had eaten because of dire need. He said to himself, woe unto me, how can I eat someone else's fruits without his permission? I'll make it bound, binding upon myself not to leave this place until I find the owner of this garden and ask him to forgive me for having eaten one of his apples. After a brief research, he found the owner's house. He knocked on the door and the owner of the garden came out and asked him what he wanted. Sabit said, I entered your garden that borders the river and I took this apple and ate half of it. Then I remembered it does not belong to me. And so I asked you now to excuse me for having eaten it and forgive me for my mistake. The man said, I will forgive you for your mistake, but on one condition. Sabit asked, and what is that condition? He said that you marry my daughter. Although he was unprepared for this, Sabit complied, I will marry. The man said, but he do this. Indeed, my daughter is blind. She does not see. Mute, she does not speak. Deaf, she does not hear. Sabit was shocked and asked for some time to ponder over the situation. A difficult predicament indeed. Did he, he find himself in now? What should I do? What should he do? He realized that to be tested by such a woman, to take care of her and to serve her all, are all better than to eat from the foul matter of hellfire as a reward for the apple that he ate. After all, the days of this world are limited. So he said that, you know, it is better to burn in the hellfire than to just marry this woman and to take care of her. So he returned and he accepted the condition to marry the girl, seeking his reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Lord of all that exists. He was nonetheless somewhat anxious in the days prior to the marriage. He thought, how can I communicate? How can I communicate or have a fulfilling relationship with a woman who never, neither speaks, nor she sees, nor hears? So miserable did he become that he almost wished for the earth to swallow him up before the appointed date. Yet despite such apprehensions, he placed his complete trust upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and said, there is neither might nor power except with Allah. Indeed to Allah do we belong and indeed to him shall we return. On the day of marriage, he saw her for the first time. She stood up before him and said, peace, mercy and blessing of Allah be upon you. So she said, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. When he saw her grace and beauty, he was reminded of what he would see when he would imagine the fair maidens of paradise, that is, gorgeous Hurul Ain. After a brief pause, he said, what is this? She indeed speaks, hears and sees. He then told her what her father said earlier. She said, my father has spoken the truth. He said, I was mute because I do not speak any forbidden word. And I have never spoken to any man who is not lawful to me. That is, she has never spoken to any namahram. And I am indeed deaf in the sense that I have never sat in the gathering in which there is backbiting, slander, or false and vain speech. And I am indeed blind in the sense that I have never looked upon a man who is not permissible for me. The fruit of this marriage was the birth of a child who grew up to be known as Abu Hanifa ibn Thabit, none other than the famous Imam Abu Hanifa, the founder of Hanafi School of Islamic Legal Knowledge, Fiqh, which has been globally accepted until today. 
So reflect upon how Sabit and his wife feared and respected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the amazing blessing this upon this open up for them. Look also at how this woman kept herself chaste, pious in her hijab, so much so that she was considered mute, deaf, and blind. Allah Akbar. So this is all what Tayyib is. This is all what risk on Tayyib and also encompasses. It's not just what we eat. It's also what we marry, what we get in terms of our relationship, in terms of our friendships. So halal and tayyib in Islam is not just restricted to what we eat and drink, but it, it, it goes on with everything, like, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we learn in this dua that, you know, we are asking in this dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I ask for a deed that is accepted. So remember, my dear sisters, deeds that are accepted are deeds that are done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Deeds that are done with sincerity. Deeds that are done according to Quran and Sunnah. And Iman is the requirement for acceptance of good deeds. Okay? So that is where the dua of Umar ta'ala anha comes and he says, Allahumma j'al amali kullahu saliha wajal li wajhika qalisa wa la tajal li hadin fihi shayya. Oh Allah, make my deeds righteous and make them sincerely for your sake and let not anyone else have a share in them. That is in the intention. And if the de deed is done with the wrong intention, for the wrong reasons, it is not going to be accepted. With that, I will end here and I will let you know what your action points are. Again, you have to share the dua with your family, with your loved ones, and you have to read this dua every day seven times. And you have to do this time, you have to self-analyze yourself. Write in a notebook. Your deeds that you do purely to gain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. So I will fin uh, end here and I will now take your reflections. Here is the reflection time. So what have we learned today and how are we going to change ourselves in the light of th this dua, in the light of the etiquettes of dua, what changes are we going to make from this point onwards? Who is there to reflect? <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum. Uh, today we learned the etiquettes of dua. <clears throat> we should always uh, pray. We, uh, first, we should praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah loves to praise, to be, to be praised. And uh, we should uh, raise, our, raise uh, our hands uh, towards the sky. And we should face the Qibla. So these are... Like these are some of the points. Like we should we should cry. So Barakallah. Allah Taala, jitra ham roenge. Allah Taala ki aagyo to Allah Taala ko bhot acha lagta hai ki mere samne mujse koi banda mang raha hai. Or bas bas. Barakallah. And I am going to share something that Sister Yasmin has written. Engage in righteous actions and be more mindful of our actions. Like we are we doing it for the sake of Allah or to gain praise from our friends? Our community members are we doing it really really for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so barakallah fiqh sister yasmin really appreciate you participating so any other sister who wants to share something assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu sister sadia alhamdulillah we learned uh, three very important things in this dua uh, ilman nafia, that beneficial knowledge, pure sustenance, and acceptable deeds. And we all know that these things are very important in one uh, Muslim uh, person's life. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, used to recite this dafa after every Fajr prayer. And uh, beneficial knowledge is like, um, like knowledge you are spreading to us. Even if it's little, however, whatever knowledge we have, we should spread to other. And spreading knowledge is a sadka jariya. As my father used to say, when a this person is deceased, three things are will be uh, always benefit him. Uh, ongoing charity, beneficial knowledge, like teaching other and uh, the righteous child who will pray for them. And of course, uh, the other things I will let explain other sisters too, yeah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise the ranks of your father and accept all Amen. your righteousness on Amen. his behalf as well. Amen. Sister Faisal. Any other sister?
So you asked me, Nehmed, you have unmuted yourself. Go ahead, my dear sister. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, uh, before making dua to Allah, we should praise Allah. Say hamdo sana and tarif of Allah. Hmm. Then make our dua. Very well done. Because Allah listens to who? He praises him. Allah listens to the one who praises him. Barakallahu feek. Sami Allahu liman hamidah. Right? Anyone else? Before I end the session? We should pray for all Muslims. Oh, sorry, something. Yeah, yeah. Muslim. Go ahead. Yeah, Sister so, Sabi. So, so, you we, we should pray for all Muslims and we should say Amen. This is very important to say Amen after, uh, after we pray. Yeah, because uh, remember, after we do, yeah. these, uh, Jews are very jealous of this word Amen. And yes. So spread Salam and spread Amen and teach children and your friends and everyone around you. And don't ever feel shy that, you know, you know, I have little knowledge or, you know, I'm speaking with you based on a very little knowledge that I have, but, you know, um, I, whatever I have to do, I have to do it. It's a, an incumbent on each and every Muslim to do so, to spread whatever they have learned. Allah's, um, Allah's messenger says, ayah, spread on my behalf, even if it is an ayah. So Sister Samia has unmuted herself. Assalamu alaikum. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I like the part, uh, the most is uh, to expect the best from Allah. Uh, and like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, Allah says, I am to my slave as he thinks of me. I like that. always. always. Barakallahu, my dear sister. So we'll end here. And please keep reflecting, keep sharing. Don't shy away from sharing. Um, we are all here to learn from each other, right? So, Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiru wa natubu ilayka assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Looking forward to another session next week, inshallah. So, I will end the recording here.